Good evening. It is good to be back with you. The words that our Lord spoke during his encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4 are so instructive on so many levels and in so many ways. This evening, because we are beginning a preaching series, I'd like to focus in particular on the words of our Lord in verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit in truth. The secret of why sat has just been revealed. Worshiping in spirit and truth. It may not, may not seem like a big deal to you, but this used to be a preaching series many, many moons ago called Preaching What We Practice. And Deirdre reminded me just recently that Susie and Deirdre, they kind of missed the Pawip lessons. You see, Pawip doesn't work as well as Wysad, I don't think, so I thought a new name was uh, called for. Worshiping in spirit and in truth. We're very familiar with that verse. We're familiar with that command, that admonition. Our interest is heightened and our desire is heightened because God is seeking such. And that kind of makes you pause. God is looking for people who will worship Him in spirit and truth. Those are special people. And we as God's people want to be those people. Okay, we know the command. We know God desires it. Well, what's the problem? Well, we need to understand it, don't we? What does it exactly mean to worship in spirit and in truth? This preaching series begins with an introduction into worship itself, and then we'll talk about various aspects of our worship. Tonight, we're going to talk about what does it mean to worship? And you say, well, that's silly, Rick. It means, um, you know, worship. But it's really not good to define a word by itself. What does it mean to worship? And it's actually a topic that once you start diving into, boy, that's a, a Carolian or Lewis. I'm not sure how you would say it. Uh, that's a rabbit hole you can lose yourself in. This evening, let's begin our series by talking about what worship is, what does it mean then to worship in spirit? And then what does it mean to worship in truth? Again, seems like pretty straightforward stuff. You ought to be out of here in five minutes. But you know better. That's not going to happen. What does it mean to worship? Well, what does worship mean? In the English, the word that we have, worship, where does that word come from? I'm a big fan of entomology, not, not the study of insects, but uh, where words come from. Um, and the word worship in English comes from the concept of worthy of the ship. That's where the word comes from. It's an old English word. If you're going to go travel by ship a long distance, say you're going to cross the Atlantic Ocean and come to the, the New World, what can you put on the ship? Can you put anything on it? Can you put your bathtub? Can you put... No. You only have enough room to put the most necessary, special thing. you got to have water. What are you talking about? We're sailing on water. Ah, it's a little salty though, right? we got to have water. The British eventually found out you got to have some kind of fruit. Otherwise, you'll get scurvy and have all these kind of problems. A uh, little side note for your trivia. What do they call British seamen? They call them limeys. Why do they call British limeys? Guess what they took on their ship? Lots of lime for the vitamin C. So you got to take water. you got to take enough food. You've got to take munitions and things to protect yourself. So what goes on the ship back in the day are the only the most special, necessary things. Can you see how that idea could turn into what worship is? That which is most precious, most necessary, first and foremost, is worthy of the ship. That's 
worship. Well, that's where the word comes from in English. What about the Greek word? The New Testament is written in Koine Greek. There are actually five words that are translated in various places as worship. Let's look into them. The first one is this word Eusebia. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17 and verse 23. Eusebia is translated worship in certain places, but it tends to be more tied to the concept of service in worship. Acts 17 and verse 23. Paul on Mars Hill addressing the Athenians said, verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, Mars Hill, and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, that's Eusebia there, I found an altar with this inscription. So Eusebia is sometimes translated as worship. And it has the concept, like I said, of service, more focused on service. The next word, liturgia. You probably get a concept of another word that comes from that. That's where the word liturgy comes from, from this Greek word. Turn to Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. Like Eusebia, even more so, liturgia is tied to the service of the temple, the service that's done during worship. In Acts 13 and verse 2, we read about Paul and Barnabas getting ready to be sent off on the first missionary journey. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Uh, see the word minister there? That's the word liturgia. Well, then why did you bring it up as worship? Well, if you have an ESV, it says, As they worshiped the Lord. Same thing with the NIV, has worship there instead of uh, minister to. So, Eusebia, liturgia, and latreo. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, and verse 10. The temptation of our Lord. Latreo, very similar to liturgia, tied to the acts of service in worship. But, sometimes translated as worship. Matthew 4 and verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Satan had said, I will give all these things to you if you'll simply fall down and worship me. The word worship there is not latreo. Jesus answered in verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written that you shall worship the Lord your God. That word translated worship, not Latreo, and him only you shall serve. There's Latreo. But in certain places and uses, in some translations, it is translated as worship. Threskia is the last or second to last word we're going to look at. Threskia, turn to Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. Threskia more often than not, is translated as religion, but at times translated as worship. Acts 24 and verse 14. Paul's defense before Felix. And in verse 14, Paul said, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. That word translated worship is threskia here. The most common word in Greek that's translated as worship is proskuneo. Okay? Um, I can hear Gary Hampton say, so you've got to say it like, uh, like Dan Winkler would say. Proskuneo. You know, you've got to get that, uh, that silly little statement to it. Proskuneo, again, etymology I love, is a fascinating con compound word. Pros means toward. Kaneo is the word where we get canine from. And it means dog. 
To proskuneo is to dog towards. What in that world does that mean? Well, think. In ancient times, if you were going to give uh, reverence to a king, especially in the east, how would you do it? Kowtowed, right? On your hands and knees, like a dog. And to kiss the ring. Picture, uh, I don't have to do much to picture it. Picture a dog. You come home and, and there are three dogs in your house. And you come in and what do they do? Now, I mean, Molly, sure, she's asleep over there snoring. But uh, what's Penny doing? Well, I mean, yeah, she's barking obnoxiously and making you wish she wasn't there. But what's Charlie doing? Charlie's coming up to you, and he's all excited to see you. Think of a dog running up to you. Uh, think of Juniper coming up to you. Guess what that is? That's proskuneo, okay? So when we worship God, that's what we're supposed to do. No, but the concept is there. To kiss towards, to dog towards. And I've always found this interesting. Turn, hold your, well, you don't have to hold your place there. If you turn back to Psalm 2, the second psalm, the first psalm, the foolishness, the contrast between those who serve God and those who don't serve God, and the fate, the contrasting fate of the two. And Psalm 2 is the foolishness of those who seek to oppose God, to ignore Him. What's he going to do with those who band together and rise up to try to fight against him or to fight against his anointed one? He laughs in derision at them. But then he gives them advice. Because in verse 9, what did he say? He said, he's going to break you with a rod of iron in his hand when the anointed one comes. What's the advice? Verse 10, now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Look at the next verse. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way. I don't think that's an accident that that concept is that kissing towards, which is proskuneo. So, worship. You take all those words together and we see there's service, religious service, there's religion itself, and then there's this concept of kowtowing and kissing toward, and all of that is worship. So now the concept of what exactly worship is is clear as mud, right? No, it still needs to be defined. And I'll be honest, because we're Christians, right? So it becomes a figure of speech, because I try to be honest all the time. Um, the idea of what exactly worship is, when it starts, when it stops, I don't think it's been nailed down very well. I've been to Fried Hardeman lectures where they struggled with the concept, where they would make statements like this. Okay, um, we're going to have the uh, school secretary, Mrs. So-and-so, come out and make an, a statement. She's going to make an announcement. So right now, we are concluding our worship. The lady would come out, she would make an announcement, she would go back out, and they would say, okay, we are now resuming worship. Now, we understand probably why that was done. Because we ought not have a woman lead in the worship service. Well, she wasn't, she was just making an announcement. Well, for the conscience of all involved, let's make an announcement, we're stopping now, and now we're restarting. The best definition I think I've heard of worship, of what it means. Worship is that which we purposefully offer up to God. Again, that's not super clear in every aspect, but that's what we have. It is that which we offer up to our God. Can't worship by accident. <gasps> Did I just worship God? Oh no! I wasn't even thinking about it. No, no, you can't. You could go through an act of worship, but if you didn't intend to do it and you didn't do it with your heart, it really wasn't done. James Meadows used to say, and again, I wish I had a man's voice so I could do, do him justice, but I can't. Uh, 
But he would say, you remember where Jesus said, if you go to worship and you remember you've got, uh, your brother's got something against you, leave your gift there and go get reconciled to your brother. He said, that's a serious thing. It's more important that you get reconciled than you try to worship God with something wrong between you and your brother. A man could go 40 years to the church building and never worship one single time. What are you talking about? I went to the building for 40 years. and did it. But if you didn't do it as you're supposed to, it's as if you never did. So worship is what we purposefully, thoughtfully offer up to the Lord. It has been correctly said, all of worship is service, but not all of service is worship. Because we're supposed to do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? All. So therefore, we're offering up all of our life, therefore every second of our life is worship. No. Right? That doesn't fit. I can think of many things I engage in that, that that's not worship. You know, when I shaved this morning, believe it or not, I did shave. It's just my grandpa's beard. Um, five minutes after I'm done shaving, I need to shave again. But um, I wasn't worshiping God then. I was preparing to worship God, but that was service, not worship. All my life is spent in service. When I'm sleeping, I'm serving God, but I'm not worshiping. How are you serving? I'm getting rest so I can be about the work of the Lord. I do all in the name of the Lord. All worship is service, but not all service is worship. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. So that's what worship is. I hope it helped to shine a little bit of light. If it's something that you're purposely offering up to God. Now, it's not a thing. I can offer up my heart in prayer. I can offer up my goods uh, when we do contribution. I offer up my heart when I sing from my heart. Um, I offer up my thought and my humility and, and my thoughts when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Again, there's lots of ways where I offer myself up. Uh, I offer my, the destruction of my eyes as we study and study and study and study this book. So those are aspects of worship. That's worship. What does it mean then to worship in spirit? Well... Context determines meaning. It's a phrase you can get tired of hearing, but it's because it is a fundamental truth in any kind of Bible study endeavor. The word that is translated there in John chapter 4, worship in spirit, is the Greek word pneuma. And yes, I know it should be pronounced panuma, but the P is silent. Okay? So pneuma. Well, what does pneuma mean? Exactly. What does pneuma mean? Pneuma means wind. Pneuma means spirit, small s, my spirit. Uh, that's a spirited animal you have there, small s, pneuma. The Holy Spirit, pneuma. Even breath. Um, uh, all scripture is God-breathed. There's a root there of nuas, which is from pneuma. Okay? Okay. Um, you're probably thinking of it. We have an English word that comes from this that troubles people often called pneumonia, right? Pneumonia. And why is it start with pneuma? Because it has to do with the lungs and the breath. So pneuma is that word. Well, what's the context here? Jesus said God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what does it mean? It means our spirit. He's not talking about we need to be like inside the Holy Spirit. It means with our spirit, our being, our intellect, our heart, we have to worship Him. Okay? In spirit and in truth. Well, how do you worship God in spirit? What does it actually mean? It means that when we bring ourselves to worship God and understand we don't have to assemble to worship God, if we pray at home, are we not worshiping? If we sing at home, are we not worshiping? If we're studying our Bible ardently, are we not worshiping? In general, I would say, yes. And as we get into the, the different uh, acts of worship, we'll talk more about how that gets kind of strange. We've got to have the right motivation. Why are we engaging in this 
worship. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 have always stilled me and filled me with that emotion and desire to serve my God and to worship Him. For the love of Christ compels us. That's why we worship God. Why? Because we can. But, but why would you even want to? Because He loves us so much that He came into this world and suffered and died for us. And that love compels us to return that love. Got to have that right motivation, and then we've got to have that right reverence. Anything that's done frequently, over and over and over, can become irreverent in our minds. Familiarity breeds contempt. Not because we're trying to be contemptuous, but if you've been a Christian 40 years, how often have you partaken of the things that I'm not gesturing to, uh, the Lord's Supper. A lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. Well, anything you do over and over can become common. So the challenge is for us to always, when we worship, to have that reverence. There's been this move for, I'm sure it's been a longer than my life, to make God kind of like our buddy. And there are indeed aspects of our Lord's relationship with us where He is our older brother. Amen? Because He came and suffered and died and He, he lived in the flesh with us. But He is our Lord. He is God. And He is to be revered. So when we worship Him, it needs to not only be motivated by that love, but it has to be with that understanding of who He is. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Can you hear it, church? What did Isaiah hear? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. When we worship God, we need to know that and understand it. And I've made the point that every time that a human being encounters deity, what's the reaction? Well, what happened in Ezekiel chapter 1? In verse 28, when Ezekiel realized he was in a divine presence, he fell to the ground as dead. What did John do in Revelation 1 and verse 17 when he turned around and he saw the glorified Lord? He fell as if dead. Why? Because God is holy, holy, holy. And we love Him and He loves us, but there is a distinction. He is holy, eminent. He is here with us, but He surpasses all. We need to remember that and have that proper reverential attitude when we go to worship. Because again, doing things over and over, we can fall into the trap of Isaiah 1, 10 through 20. What did God say to Israel? He says, why are you here in my temple? Who told you to walk in my floors? Who told you, told you to offer all these sacrifices? And they would have said, you did, Lord. But his point was, but you're doing it without your heart. You're simply going through motions. And it sickens me. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 10, God says, Is there any man in Israel who do me a favor? Stand up and shut the doors to my temple. Why? Because even though all those years, even though the captivity and the return... Still, his people viewing the worship of him as a wearisome, as a defiling thing. I'm going to give him not my best, but the rest. Somebody please shut the door. And that offensive attitude in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. God's not doing what we want him to do. What's he want? What's he want, priests? Does he want some more money? Does he want some more oil? More sacrifices? What's he want me to do? Sacrifice my child to him? How disrespectful. As if God needs anything from us. And he tells them, he's told you, old man. He wants you to walk humbly with him. Love justice and mercy. That's what he wants. Be like him. That's how you worship in spirit. You remember who God is. You remember who you are. 
and you remember all that he's done for you in Christ. And then you'll worship him in spirit. Well, what does it mean to worship in truth? When you worship in spirit, it will lead you to worship in truth. Because you will seek, you will, as Paul said in that same chapter, Acts 17, you will grope for God. Who is he? What does he want? How may I please him? Why? All that he's done for me. Well, he's told us. He's revealed once for all everything that he wants with regards to worship. Those who worship in truth are those who worship in spirit and seek to do what he has said. Not what they want to do. I love this analogy because it gives everybody, a, especially this time of the year in April, when you write your check to the uh, federal government and then to the wonderful state of Virginia for taxes, did you determine how much you wrote? I certainly didn't because I would have had a different thing in mind. Who determines how much you pay? The person you pay. Who determines how you worship? The one who is to be worshipped. Not the worshiper. Not as so many sadly in our world today say, well, I'm just going to do whatever makes me happy and, and I'm going to say, this is for you, God. Uh, watch me river dance. That's for you, Lord. Gave it to you. Okay, that's not how that works. That's disrespectful. He has told us how he'll be worshipped. And, and he's always done that. I, I'm always, I've got this verse always in my head lately. When God gave manna to the children of Israel, do you remember why he gave it to them? They had to feed him, or he had to feed them. But what did he say? He said, I'm going to give them this manna to test them, to see if they'll obey me. I've told them, I'm going to give you all the food you need. Here's how you do it. Will you be content? God has told us how to worship him. It's revered here, revealed here in black and white, and sometimes red. Will we be content with it? Or will we seek other forms and expressions that are more pleasing to us or it's more my natural talent and ability? You know, the river dance thing. No. No. The Lord has revealed to us. And time escapes us, so we will move quickly. We have noticed in our study of the Bible that there are five acts, at least, of worship. There is the Lord's Supper, which we partook of this morning in the very famous 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following. We are invited to the Lord's table to sup with Him, to remember His body given for us and His blood shed for us. Nourished by those things, we live today and we worship. We prepare our minds, we sing a song to prepare our minds for that act of worship, and then... I don't know your routine, but as we partake of the bread, or as I partake of the bread, I visualize that is his body. Now, I'm not talking about trans <laughs> uh, substantiation or consubstantiation. I'm simply saying I'm thinking of my Lord's body and how he gave it for me and all the things he suffered. And then I usually follow it with a pathetic kicking of myself going, and there you are crying about your shoulder. There you are crying about this. And look what he did for you. And I eat that bread. And then that juice. If it's macabre, it's macabre. But here's what I've always done. I drink that juice, and before I swallow it, I picture it coming from the foot of my Lord. And it is his blood. In my mind and I swallow it and it is not sweet it is always a bitter thing I want it always to be a bitter thing for me you can have your own thing because I remember what that is I submit and humble myself to what he did and we obey singing is an act of worship Ephesians 5 and verse 19 Colossians 3 and verse 16 Parallel passages, we sing. He gave us the breath of life and we return the breath of life in our singing. Making melody in our hearts, not with our banjos, 
in our hearts, singing to him of all the things that he did and thanking him, singing to one another as I sing to you, you're singing to me and all together singing to God and what a glorious noise that is. Instructing one another with these words. How powerful are these songs we sing? But only if you apply yourself. If you just sit there mechanically, you mouth and make noises. Or let's say you sit there and you don't even make a noise. Understand, you have not worshipped. You can go through the mechanical process of making the noise with your mouth and have not worshipped. But when you consider those words and you sing those words and your heart ought to be broken, you have worshipped your God. Prayer is worship. Truly that which is offered up to God. Jesus in Matthew 6, 9 said, when you pray, and then he went on. It's assumed God's people will be a praying people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 7, 17, uh, pray without ceasing. Meaning not only do you often fall to your knees and pray to God, but you're always having that conversation with him. That constant walk with him. He's there. You might as well have that conversation. He speaks to us through Scripture. He allows us to talk with Him. The veil has been removed, church. Why not have that conversation? Giving is worship. Jesus said we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You understand your wallet is a part of that. Love God with all that we are. And in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we understand about giving contributions at the local assembly to meet needs. That need in 1 Corinthians 16 was that famine that was going on in Judea. But there's, there's lots of needs. Sudden needs and some just maintenance needs. But we give and we offer it up to God. It is worship. That's why there's so many admonitions about God loving a cheerful giver. Because if you give begrudgingly, how are you any different than those people in the days of Micah? What's he want now? Another check. I work all this time and he wants, who gave you your money? Who gave you your talents? Who gives you this life? Who? On and on and on. One little more thing to think about with giving. If we hold on so tightly to our stuff and our things, what else can we receive? Nothing. But if we receive and we give, always got a free hand to receive. Hearing God's word is worship. I, I have struggled with this concept. I have had trouble with what you are doing right now being worship. Partially because you and I are kind of doing different things. I'm a speaking and you're a listening. Okay? But what's it all about? I'm speaking the word of God to God's people, to encourage godliness. That is a humility, a life, and energy that I am offering up to God. And you, you are suffering through and enduring on and on. Hearing the word of God and submitting to it. And when those things are said that touch your heart, that are a truth that maybe is difficult for you, in your heart you have that choice of amen or oh my. Amen. Bible study, reading and studying, that's hearing God's word. That is worship. But here's the issue we run into. If the Lord's Supper is worship and my private Bible study is worship, then there appears to be almost degrees of worship. And I don't mean degrees as in God thinks of one more highly than the other, but do we act differently? Um, when I'm home studying, I'm probably not dressed the way I am right now. Am I in this cheap suit to impress you guys? I am not. Well, why did I dress up? Well, that's another whole sermon, and it's a bulletin article coming up. In short, I'll say, for glory and for beauty, those of you who know, know. It's to honor God with this presentation. When I'm at home, sitting in my chair, getting ready to go to bed in my bedroom, I'm not wearing this cheap suit, but I am worshiping my God because I am submitting my mind and I am groping for Him. So there's 
worship, and, and, and I, I hazard to, to say, you know, there's, there's a, maybe a high form of worship, and I, I don't like those words, but it's different, isn't it? People in the audience? It's different. I meant balcony, not the audience. To conclude, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That would be worship. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Latreo. There. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One of the things that he has commanded us and taught us and expects of us is worship with the right spirit and in truth. Maybe more powerfully. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. So that's what we do when we worship, no matter where we are and what kind we're doing. Draw near with a true heart, worship in spirit, in full assurance of faith, in truth having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And, and then corporate, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We have been given this incredible honor on this day to draw near, nearer to the throne of God and to worship Him together as His people. There will come a time, church, when all of God's people will stand before Him and be able to worship Him together forever. How exactly that's going to be, what exactly that's going to be, I don't know. But I want to be there. How about you? Till then, we have this. This incredible privilege that no one else in the world enjoys. Only his people are allowed to come and to worship in spirit and in truth. So the question is, what are you doing with that incredible honor? Hopefully you're availing yourself of it. You're remembering who God is and you're looking forward to that day of worship and those times of worship in prayer and Bible study. And hopefully, you're looking forward to the time of being together with people we plan to be together with forever. Oh, happy day that's coming, church. Till then, let us worship our God in spirit and truth. Looking forward to that day when it will never end. If you're not a Christian this evening, you cannot worship God acceptably. Sin separates you. But He has provided a way. He loves you so much. How much? Look at the cross. That you might be free from your sin. How? Look at the cross. He's commanded you to believe all that He's done, to understand it, and to submit yourself and humble yourself to die to sin in baptism and rise again to newness of life, then you can worship the one and only true God in spirit and in truth. If you've never taken him up on his offer of grace, why not this evening? Christians, it's easy to get distracted. It's easy, like those in Malachi, to look at the worship and the work of the church and say, oh, what a weariness. But hopefully any fleeting thought like that is chased away with holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And you remember who He is. If you haven't been doing what you ought, turn back. If we can help in any way, we'd ask that you come. As together we stand and sing.